It's a great pleasure to welcome you all to the Rockefeller Institute for a, a program that was widely anticipated by our membership. As you remember, back in, uh, in the summer, the executive committee, we decided that we were going to survey the membership and we were going to see what kind of programs that you wanted to have. And actually, coming up in the not too distant future, just about every one of your top picks. Interestingly, this particular program was far and away your top pick by about seven percentage points. About 18% of you said, we really want to know more about the Constitutional Convention. And so we're pleased to welcome you here tonight for this program. Before I introduce you and, and introduce the program and introduce our speaker tonight, I just want to give you a little bit of background because many of you have been asking, what is the Rockefeller Institute? And, and, and I was kind of struck by the fact that a great many of you have never been here before. So for those of you who have not been here before, the Rockefeller Institute was created in statute in 1981, and it was through the leadership of uh, former SUNY Chancellor Cliff Wharton. And it was Chancellor Wharton's belief that the SUNY system should have a center for the study of public policy at the local and the state and the national levels. Today we're a part of the SUNY system. We serve all 64 campuses and we annually conduct research in our core policy specialties, which are fiscal policy and healthcare policy, education policy, and that's both uh, domestic and international, and also both at the primary level and all the way up to higher education and federalism. Our work is conducted both by staff researchers as well as researchers and collaborators who come from throughout the SUNY system and oftentimes, or sometimes I should say, outside the SUNY system. For example, right now we have a, we're up to a 42 state um, field network with the Brookings Institution and the Fells Institute of Government at the University of Pennsylvania and we're studying the implementation of the Affordable Care Act I just got back a couple of weeks ago from Atlanta where we rolled out our 28th report and that was on the implementation of the ACA in Georgia. It's because of this commitment to help promote understanding and awareness of what happens in Albany that we really took on the project uh, that I'm going to be talking to you about tonight and also our speaker is going to be talking to you about tonight and that is a multi-year campaign, a public education campaign focused on the Constitutional Convention. Now I'm not going to talk to you too much about the specifics because you don't do that when you're, when you're standing in front of Jerry Benjamin. He knows too much and I know too little. But what I will say is during the course of the next several years through the work of a team of extraordinary experts including Jerry, and our partners, including the Government Law Center at Albany Law School, the Benjamin Center for Public Policy Initiatives at SUNY New Paltz, which was renamed after Jerry and as a tribute to Jerry uh, this past year, the League of Women Voters of New York State and the, and the Siena Research Institute, we're gonna, going to be conducting statewide public programming, publishing journals and books, producing documentaries and other special media projects, and keeping our policy experts on the road to speak to countless organizations seeking more information about the Constitutional Convention referendum, which will be coming up in just, uh, just over a year. The essential issue about which we will speak tonight is the inevitable question which will appear on the ballot, uh, the state ballot, on November 7th, 2017, which will ask voters if they are in favor of a convention to consider modification to the New York State Constitution. That's really paraphrased, and Jerry will get more into the specifics of the language, but why would we do that? And that's why we're here tonight. Our presenter is uh, Gerald Benjamin, the Associate Vice President for Regional Engagement and Director of the Benjamin Center for Public Policy Initiatives at SUNY New Paltz. Jerry previously served as the Chair of the, of the Department of Political Science and Dean of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences at the college. He's also former director of New York State and local studies here at the Rockefeller Institute. From 1993 through 1995, he served as research director for the New York State Constitution Revi uh, Revi Revision Commission, which, and he was co-editor with Hank DeLay of the commission's papers, and it was published in book form as Decision 97 by the Rockefeller Institute, still available for sale through the SUNY Press, and is co-editor of the forthcoming new uh, volume on New York's broken constitution. That's what, that's what it's entitled, The Governance Crisis and the Path to Renewed Greatness. That will be coming out very shortly. 
In the state and in this country, there's no one better equipped to give this talk or to answer your questions. And so in that regard, I feel very, very privileged to bring up a colleague, uh, someone who serves as a member of our board of overseers and someone who I consider to be a very dear friend, Dr. Gerald Benjamin. So Jerry, to you. So that advances, and there's the laser pointer if you want to. Got it. Thank you. Okay. Good evening. I'm, I'm delighted to be here. I was actually present at the creation of this organization some years ago, uh, uh, and um, uh, Nelson Rockefeller, who I actually had opportunity to meet and talk with on several occasions, was a great hero of mine, and so uh, this is a place of some importance to me. Uh, regarding naming something after me. I did have an early conversation with the president and told him that I was uh, Jewish and, uh, uh, and uh, as a general practice um, uh, in my culture and tradition, we only name things after people after they die. <laughs> and I wasn't willing to meet the condition. Uh, he, uh, he went out and found some examples to the contrary and we went forward, uh, ultimately went forward. And it's a great honor to be uh, to be here and to have that have that ha happened as a result of a career that spans almost uh, 50 years in uh, in the state university. Tonight, I'm here to talk to you about uh, this question. I, I will say that I, I, I would welcome uh, questions at any at any point. Um, so uh, you can either constrain yourself or jump up and shout out something. I'm okay. It's a small group. This question, shall there be a convention to revise the Constitution and amend the same? That's actually a question that's embedded in the Constitution. I give the citation as uh, Article 19, Section 2. So that question is prescribed and must be asked every 20 years in New York on the ballot to New York voters. And what we face now, and, and uh, so uh, I, I, I like to note that in, in your lifetime as a New Yorker, if you're born and raised here, you'll probably have three or four times chances to vote on this question. This is a question of generational ca character. It rises every generation. And uh, it's uh, important, and, and these long cycles are, 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 our politics, as all of you know, are cyclical and predictable. We know when our elections will be held. We know what year they'll be held. We know what date they'll be held upon. But these long cycles are not well known in New York and their convergence or failure to converge with events and circumstances is often very consequential for their effectiveness. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of background on why we have this opportunity and then some of the issues embedded in this opportunity that some of you may already have thought about and if you have not thought about them, I hope to provoke you to think about them. So New York must have a referendum as asking citizens whether they wish to hold a constitutional convention every 20 years. There's no action required by the governor, no action required by the legislature. As, as you heard, the next scheduled vote is on November 7, 2015. 2017, sorry. <laughs> We're not going backwards to vote. <laughs> Why do we have this mandatory referendum question and requirement? These are two quotations from the 1846 Constitutional Convention where this referendum requirement was adopted. The first is from uh, Ansel Bascom, who was from Seneca County. All power is preserved to the people. We propose this so that once every 20 years they might take the matter of how they are governed into their own hands. So it's fundamental recognition of, of the sovereignty of the people in governing themselves. And then uh, the father of the language, Richard Marvin from Chautauqua County. By the way, notice the location of the, of the, uh, of the origin, the home counties of, of transformative New Yorkers. Uh, as upstaters, you should be attentive to that. Uh, I think our, 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 our I'm going to riff on this, our, our heritage and contribution to New York is not always understood or acknowledged. Uh, Richard Marvin, who is a... Uh, uh, the author of the provision, without the intervention of any other body, if the people were dissatisfied with the Constitution, the people could say so and act accordingly. And if not, they, they, the existing Constitution would continue. So it's not only a, a, a moment for, a, for critique or change, it's a moment for affirmation. 
And it therefore becomes significant and important that people know what they're doing. They know they have their, uh, the opportunity, and they make that choice effectively. We know back to the 1894 convention, we have evidence that people don't choose. They don't attend to initiative questions in New York. They're unused to it, and we'll talk a little bit more, more about that. So even those who turn out often don't vote on matters like this. And that would be the failure to choose, which I think is, is a, a challenge we want to avoid, we want to confront. Many people do not know there is a state constitution. This is not a, a contrivance of mine. We don't have polling on everything, although people who pay attention to uh, the press may think we do. Uh, but we have occasional polling on the question of whether people know they have a state constitution, and about half the people in the country don't know that this is a constitutional system in America, not a constitution, a system with a constitution. It's a system with 51 constitutions. The statewide referendum process has only limited use in New York, so people are not used to voting on referendum questions. They do vote on constitutional amendments, and we do occasionally vote on borrowing, although, as you know, far less than we should as the borrowing bypasses the Constitution, which is a fundamental uh, 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 embedded question. The opportunity to vote on this question is, occurs once every generation. Therefore, citizens get to make this choice only three or four times in a lifetime. That should, that should focus the mind, in my opinion. Con the ConCon con vote remains a mystery for the vast majority. Support for ConCon weakens still strong. This is from the Siena poll of October 26, 2015. Siena is cooperating with our effort to educate the public on this matter. More than 70% say they have heard nothing at all about the 2017 vote. Most people support the idea, while most people know nothing about it. So this can be, re re be regarded as discouraging or an opportunity. Uh, I was, as you, as you heard, I work with Governor, I'm a Republican and, and uh, was appointed by the Governor Cuomo anyway to head his research staff for this pros project, which uh, uh, makes me especially pleased and proud to have been, gotten appointed. And uh, the, uh, the, on the run-up to the question in 97, we actually had over 60% of New Yorkers who wanted to have a constitutional convention. By the, by the vote, we lost by a two-to-one margin. So there's an interesting story to tell about the politics of this sort of thing in New York. Who's, who feels, who feels uh, uh, engaged, who feels they have something at stake, and who chooses to oppose this opportunity, and who chooses to support it. There have been uh, a little background. There have been 146 state constitutions in force in the United States. So the idea that we don't, the, the fundamental idea that we're talking about a constitution and that we don't change constitutions because of our reverence for the U.S. Constitution doesn't extend to state constitutions. We've had lots of state constitutions in force uh, in the United States. In New York, we've had four separate constitutions adopted. And our current constitution dates to 1894. The revision in 1938, some regard as a new constitution, but I, I think is better understood as a revision. That was the last big revision. The last state constitutional convention was held by Rhode Island in 1986. It's really important that, uh, to me that people know this. It used to be common to change state constitutions. Now it's very uncommon. It's almost uh, unknown. And this is the entrenchment of systems in New York uh, and across the country that is different. There's something, some big difference that has, that has developed in our attitude about our, the, the, the opportunities and uh, challenges of changing our fundamental institutional arrangements. New York's last convention was held in 1967. The mandatory referendum votes of 77 and 97 both were defeated. 77, some of you, may recall was just after the fiscal New York City, New York State fiscal crisis of 75. So there was a genuine argument that we were a little bit um, fatigued by dealing with extreme circumstances, events, and we weren't unprepared for institutional change. 97 was a, a year that I uh, was involved with. And as I said, I'll talk a little bit more about the issues and preparation there. The period between 67 today is the longest in state history without a constitutional convention. This seems odd to me. And I didn't 
realize it until I was talking to a great scholar of the state constitution, a guy named Peter Gailey, who uh, pointed out to me that if you look at all the uh, uh, conventions we've held in New York, this is the longest time that we've gone without one. Now, this is a, a, a point uh, raised by a, a very uh, good scholar of state constitutions. I won't burden you with too much uh, law review uh, qu quotation or academic scholarship, but John Dinan is a, a, a student of, of constitutions across the state, country, and he points out that two critical factors in coming close to serious change are gubernatorial leadership and preparation. Some of you may have seen that I had an op-ed piece in the Times Union yesterday in which I uh, talked about the, the very uh, positive development uh, that the governor has announced that he's going to prepare for this uh, convention vote with a commission. In his State of the State message, the governor said, you can see it, from ethics enforcement to the basic rules governing day-to-day -day business, the process of state government is broken. Now, this is a governor. Now, the, the contradictions in this may not be evident to everybody in the room, but this is a governor who claims high achievement and having, having brought state government into, a, into a, a effective operation. And he's now saying that we need to take a look at those things that are broken about government. Now, I'm, I'm not willing to challenge him on the contradictions since he's doing what I'd prefer that he do. But it's interesting, when I, when, whenever you talk, I've talked to, I've had the great uh, opportunity to talk to lots of governors. And governors tend to be action-oriented, four-year cycle kind of people. You know, they have to produce results in certain cycles. And uh, I've met no governor who hasn't expressed frustration and inability to move events. And sometimes that pushes governors to uh, the edges of constitutionality. So we have a current conversation going on in New York about whether the use of the executive order is appropriate and uh, whether the governor, governor has gone beyond uh, what might be uh, appropriate by uh, using powers that should be taking actions that should be taken statutorily in the legislature and not taken by the executive. Now in the, in the particulars, I don't find the particulars uh, unconstitutional. That's my personal judgment on the specifics. But in general, the aggregated consequence of reliance on executive order is a challenge to whether we have an effective representative government. We have other challenges that we know about uh, from the news, and we'll be talking a little about mentioning them. The governor believes that a convention offers the voters opportunity to achieve lasting reform. He will invest a million dollars if the legislature appropriates it. Appropriates it. And it's very important that we get legislative buy-in here, uh, and very unlikely that we will. Yeah. And the commission will also be authorized to recommend fixes to the convention delegate selection process, which experts believe is flawed. I'm going to, that's what I'm going to focus my remarks on. So we have the preparation, we have the opportunity, we have the governor. The governor's commitment is not fulsome. He's talked about certain conditions under which he'd, he'd support a convention that have to do with process change, and I'm going to talk about them. So how am I doing so far? Have I still got most people's attention? Okay, is there anybody, you know, I have to watch out for the back of the room. My common uh, practice is to halfway through to go to the back and teach from there uh, to uh, shock and awe the, uh, <laughs> the people avoiding proximity to me. I just taught a, an undergraduate class before I came here, so I'm still uh, in that mindset. Forgive me. <laughs> What's in the Constitution? You know, why should we want to change it? What can we predict from experience, constitutionally mandated process, statutory processes about, the about how we might proceed if we authorize change? What might be removed and modified? What might be added? So uh, uh, it should be obvious that people want to know, people have agendas, so some, somebody will say, I'd love to have term limits in the Constitution. Somebody else will say, term limits, what an awful idea. I'd love to have the initiative and referendum in the Constitution. The initiative and referendum, that will make us like California. What an awful, what a horrible concept. <laughs> you, know, uh, I, you know, so uh, there's, there's uh, um, agenda-related issues. What could change or would change there's process-related issues, and there's democracy-related issues. And uh, ordinarily, we don't get past the uh, 
process-related issues in presentations like this, and people want to talk about the what would change, what could change issues. So I'm going to talk a little about them at the end so that you're not completely disappointed. But the process-related stuff is connected to willingness to take risk. I think this is the same kind of decision that, that you as heads of businesses make all the time. It's a risk-benefit calculation based upon the best information you can have at the point where you have to decide. So we're talking about a risk-benefit calculation for New York at the point where we have to decide. And uh, the risks and benefits are differently perceived and understood by different people because they have different stakes and different, they bring different predispositions to the decision. This is J. J. Harvey Wilkinson. Some of you may know of him as one of the most, not most, one of the more conservative federal judges in America. He sits in Virginia. He's been considered for the Supreme Court of the United States several times, but uh, as you uh, no doubt know, he's not on the Supreme Court of the United States. But he uh, made this observation about state constitutions. They are Baroque collections of essentially statutory material. The New York Constitution I have here is 51,700 words. For comparison, the US Constitution is 8,000 words. <laughs> The state average is 26,000 words. So if we just take the com comparison to the state average, New York is twice as long. Uh, New York has uh, 1,093 provisions. Now you'll be, I hope, uh, relieved to know that I didn't count these. <laughs> Somebody writing a doctoral dissertation did it. It was an appropriate task for that purpose. <laughs> I find that very funny, but maybe you <laughs> The, the <laughs> so that th this is to say that the Constitution has a lot of stuff in it. It has a lot more than defining the uh, legislative branch, empowering the legislative branch, defining the executive, defining the judiciary, setting out the rights, uh, taking up some matters that are uh, appropriately state level matters, like the relationship between the uh, uh, state government and the local governments. It is a very detailed document. One third of these words, by the way, applies to the judicial branch. One third of the words in the New York Constitution is, is, uh, specifies that structure, powers, limits, extensions, characteristics, election processes for judges, jurisdictional matters, and so on. According to another scholar, New York is typical in that about a third of the provisions of the state constitutions are devoted to statutory type matters. Now, I, I dare say that some of you may notice that you can gamble in New York. You can gamble in Native American casinos. You can uh, gamble in bars and restaurants. You can gamble in churches. <laughs> and yet New York has a gambling prohibition in its constitution. In fact, we're building casinos around the state, and we have a gambling prohibition. In fact, the gambling prohibition has come forward lately because our, our attorney general has uh, sued to prohibit uh, blocking on the term. Fantasy. Fantasy sports. Gambling on fantasy sports. He says it's constitutionally prohibited. So he may be an extraordinary lawyer because he might have found a kind of gambling that we can't do <laughs> in New York. Well, the same year that the gambling prohibition was adopted, the forever wild provision was adopted for the New York Constitution that keeps the Catskill and Adirondack preserves forever wild, guarantees their, their, their condition. And this, uh, this forever wild provision was adopted in the face of a, an, ex an extraordinarily powerful uh, lumber industry in, the, in New York State as the gambling provision was adopted, and adopted, notwithstanding the wishes of the uh, racing industry. I noticed in one of my conversations with somebody from Saratoga. And so we ha what, what's interesting about this is that when you have the force and effect, when you have the power, you can put something in the Constitution that puts it beyond the reach of ordinary politics. So we have a civil service protection put in 1894. We have a pension guarantee put in uh, later for public workers. We have lots of provisions that particular interests in New York care a lot about. We have an education provision that gives a positive right to education, which I don't think anybody would disagree with in the room, that that's a good idea.
but we've had lots of litigation around that provision that has defined what that means and has created expectations of the state government that are being uh, expressed and argued about on a daily basis. You know, the allegation that the state is $4 billion behind meeting its obligations under certain court decisions for, uh, regarding education. So every interest in the state that has an element or, or, or a, a point of view about something in the Constitution that advantages them wants to, doesn't want that matter touched. And then when they want when they make a risk-benefit calculation, they say, well, we might be able to straighten out some of the problems we have with our legislature, but also since we uh, are opening up the Constitution, this other matter that we care about might be touched, and it's better not to take that risk and see if we can get the benefit another way, notwithstanding the fact that our experience with uh, fundamental political reform in New York is not stellar in, most, in our most recent history. Now, these processes were adopted in the 19th century. Bob said I knew a lot about this, and the unfortunate reality is that I do. <laughs> uh, so uh, let me just say that, that we are talking about 19th century procedures, and, and you can, if you want a reading list, I'll, I'm happy to provide it, but 19th century procedures in the 21st century. And the reason those 19th century procedures were adopted was because they solved 19th century problems. Democrats, a convention was called in, uh, if I can recall correctly, in uh, 1886 or 1888, and it wasn't convened until 1894 because the Democrats and Republicans couldn't decide on a process for convening it. So they said, we're going to entrench a process in the Constitution so nobody has the problem of convening it ever again. And they did. So uh, we have an unlimited question to call a convention. Now, every time I encounter a lawyer who knows about state, uh, the state constitution, I say, do we have to have an unlimited convention? I just want to find one lawyer who says, no, we can have a limited convention. And then I will have that lawyer, put, put that lawyer forward and have the argument. But I, even the most brilliant uh, people I regard as the most brilliant experts on the state constitution and local government, Richard Rafault of the Columbia Law School, for example, can't find a way for us to have an, uh, a limited convention. That means that we can't say we're just going to fix legislative corruption. We're just going to fix campaign finance. We're just going to fix redistricting. What it, say, what it says is we have to ask this question. Everything is open. Now, remember, the people rule in a democracy. The convention is their agent. Now I'm going to try something as a Jewish guy I shouldn't try. Uh, some of you might have heard of the College of Cardinals. It assembles to, I don't know, pick, find, acknowledge the Pope. I don't want to get the language wrong. It has one task and goes away as a collectivity. And that's what a constitutional convention is. It's a collectivity that has one task. It doesn't have an institutional interest. It's not a legislature that goes on and on and trying to build its powers. It is, a, it, is a, it is an institution with one task. The people call it, it does its task. The people say, yes, you did a good job. No, we did, you did a bad job. We reject your work. We accept your work. It's a one purpose entity. It's, it's transient and fundamental. And therefore, the legislature can't pass a law at, that says, we'll have a convention, but only look at the fact that we ha can have an appointed lieutenant governor. We didn't, we didn't mean for that to happen. Elected officials should be elected. That's fundamental. So we'll, ha we'll just fix that. Can't do it because the legislative body is subordinate to the convention and can't define its, its parameters, the parameters of its work. So three delegates must, so all this stuff's in the Constitution. And that's fundamental. Three delegates must be elected from each state, Senate, district, and 15 at large statewide. Now this is not a mistake. The 1894 convention was run by Republicans and they determined to use state Senate districts. And the Republicans have run the state Senate virtually continuously since 1894, with a few exceptions. And even when they haven't run it, they've run it because of their inability of their opponents to organize the body. So say Senate districts are made by Republicans, and people in New York are more Democrat than Republican, and therefore they worry about a body that's elected from state senate districts, even though it's a multi-member use of the districts. And then we have an at-large election of statewide for 15 delegates. 
Now, so the Voting Rights Act says that, uh, that uh, the use of districts for uh, the use of at-large elections is suspect because it subsumes minority choice. You'll notice that multi-member districts, Senate districts, and statewide elections of delegates are both the use of multi-member districts. So we have a, a challenge under the Voting Rights Act, first passed in 1965 and then several times repassed, with our process. And now we have uh, voting, voting technology that's much different than we used to, which is a net plus because we can, we can exercise choice more fully with the current technology properly deployed. Delegates must be compensated at the same rate as members of the assembly. This is in the Constitution. Now, we, putting aside the question of legislative, de legislative compensation for a moment, if a legislator is elected to be delegate, he or she then gets two paychecks, one for being a delegate and one for being a legislator. Not only that, he or she gets pension benefits for both jobs. That's not mandated, but that was the practice previously. You can interpret the Constitution so as to exclude the pension piece or statutorily constrain it, but the compensation piece is a problem. This is called the double dipping problem. And it not only applies to legislators who might hold, run for both offices, but judges who might be public employees while they're serving as delegates. And then there's, a, there's this curious point, which is not major, about the use of the Capitol. The, the convention is supposed to convene in the Capitol on the, immediately after the 1st of April, and we now know that the legislators are still there. This wasn't the case when the provision was written. They went home in late February, early March. Now they, they hang around a long time, so we'd have them have to figure out what to do about use of the building, and I'd like to be there for that. <laughs> So what are the, rem what are the statutory uh, uh, issues? Can we restrict statutorily? So all this is in the Constitution. What does that mean, ladies and gentlemen? It means that to change it, you have to change the Constitution. That means you, in New York, if you, don't, if you change the Constitution through the legislature, you have to do it in two separate elections, with an in two separate bodies with an intervening election passing the change. That would mean that these changes, should they be considered, would occur on the same day as the vote on whether to call a convention or not. So there'd be an, an, an increased degree of uncertainty. It would also mean that the legislature would have to do reform in order, in order to address these questions. And the legislature is not a big fan of holding a constitutional convention because it takes power out of its hands and puts it in, hand, in unknown hands, maybe partly their own hands, but partly others. So, this is, this will get, I have a slide on this, so I'm not going to anticipate myself, but think about the problem. If you need reform because you don't like the process and the reform is constitutional, you have to have the body that, you, that you're supposed to be bypassing act to give you the opportunity. Now we can't, I've, I've thought up some ideas. Uh, when I worked for the commission, I thought up some ideas with others about how to address some of this. On, uh, I'm pretty pleased with my idea about double dipping, which would be a ban on simultaneously holding two elected offices. Now, this is commonly done in local government in New York, with some exceptions. So you could run for, uh, you, I, I, I'm not a big fan of saying to somebody you can't run for an office, because I think there's a constitutional, a federal constitutional problem with that. But you could say, you know, Jerry, you can run for both offices. You can get elected to the legislature and get elected as delegate, but you can't serve in both because we can't hold, you can't hold both offices, so resign one. We could do that statutorily, but guess what? The statute would have to be passed by the legislature. So the reform in anticipation, the reform of process in anticipation of, of a, a convention vote has to occur either by legislative action to change the Constitution or legislative action to change the statutes. This, occur, this, this is uh, true of any changes in election procedures, nominating procedures, finance procedures, all of which could be could be uh, specially adopted for this special uh, process. Okay, so you're, you're getting discouraged, I know. It sounds like a downer. So let's hope that the cavalry can, ri ri can gallop in at the end and save the day. Now, what, uh, so hold that thought. <laughs> now, 
Next question is, what happened in 1967? Well, everybody says we wasted a massive amount of money. We had a constitutional convention. We opened up the whole document. We had a bunch of legislators, not too many, but 14 or 15 legislators elected. The leadership was from the legislature. The rules were from the legislature. We considered the whole document. We put the matter on the ballot, and the people rejected it. <laughs> now, this raises a couple of points of interest. First of all, why did the, why did the convention in 67 put one question before the people rather than five, six, seven questions, as they might have done, taking the controversial, most controversial matters to the side and preserving their, their work on the other stuff. I walk, I am, uh, I'll reveal myself, I worked on the New York City Charter in 1987, 88. We had our unconstitutional charter in the city. We put six questions on the ballot because we didn't want to lose our work and we put the controver most controversial stuff in separate questions and we p turned out we passed all six. In 1938, they put uh, I think nine questions on the ballot and passed seven. So the, so the way the work was presented, which was a, a decision of the leadership to try to get people to buy the whole package, was a failed strategy. That didn't mean the document was uh, a failed document. Most scholars, including Hank DeLay, who's my colleague and who's with us in this effort, lives in Ithaca and is on the SUNY Board of Trustees, a very distinguished former uh, staffer uh, with Mario Cuomo. Uh, most of us think that the, the 67 document was better. Now, I'm not going to ask you to look at the small print here, but it's here because I got tired. I got literally tired of justifying the 67 convention. Everybody, the failed learning of the lessons of history drives bad decisions for the future. So if you're a local government official and you don't like that counties have to pay a share of social service and health care costs, you should know that if the 67 Constitution was adopted, the state would be paying all those costs. That was a provision in the Constitution. If you're a person who believes that the redistricting provision we recently adopted is a sham and a scam, and ultimately leaves a veto with the minority so as to protect their interests in redistricting and leaves the ultimate power with the majority, if you believe those things, then you should know in the 67 convention there was a five-person redistricting commission established that would be an entirely neutral and would have redistricted New York's legislature and congressional districts thenceforth in a fair and equitable manner, elevating competition and making state government more, more competitive. In other words, the document wasn't a, the process wasn't a failed process. The presentation of the results was a bad decision that might have been by design or might have been by miscalculation politically. So we can't allow a misunderstanding of history to drive our decision about whether to do this. We might determine that our interests and our confidence in democratic processes in, uh, uh, in the election process and who might be elected and what they might do, we might determine that that's a bad, it's a bad risk. But we shouldn't determine on the basis of misunderstanding what happened in the past, in my, in my judgment. Now I have all these lists, and uh, um, I, is, this could be used as an eye test. <laughs> but uh, public, this one is the one I mentioned. I don't know how to make this happen. Where's the red dot? It's the little red button on top here. Is it? There it is. No, that's, that's the. the yeah. Okay. Well, right here. Number four, all public assistance and medical aid costs not paid by the national government would be borne by the state budget. That's a big one. Home rule would have been redefined. We have big fights. Down in, down in New York City, there's a big fight about home rule. New York City wants the more, greater autonomy to run New York City. I regard uh, New York City politics as a fight between New York City politicians in Albany and New York City politicians in New York City to see who runs New York City. And we are the witnesses and sometimes the victims of that fight. Some guys who were born in Brooklyn get, get to be exiled to upstate New York. <laughs> and some guys who were born in Brooklyn wake up one day and they find out that they're apple knockers. They're upstate New York. <laughs> My wife was in exile, so we have an apartment for her in Manhattan. <laughs> I live in Newport, so I'm in upstate New York. So when I, when I express uh, an idea that we may be uh, less than fully uh, represented or considered in the New York state government, uh, it's a New Yorker's bias, it's an upstater's bias. 
So forgive that if you're, you're offended by it. I hope you're not. And uh, so anyway, the home rule question is, uh, is a, seen as a New York City question. It is not a New York City question. However many local governments we have in New York, and however, however they're interacting with each other, and I don't buy the governor's number. It's a, it's a, it's an argue, a, 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 a kind of a, a debater's number of governments. We can do a lot better if we reconsidered our home rule, our article, so that we gave greater consideration to efficiency and effectiveness in local government uh, processes in, uh, in, in considering how we have our local system organized. So there is a number of slides just uh, listing. Uh, what changes there would have been. One is close to my heart. SUNY would have become constitutionalized. Now, what does that mean? Well, the devil's in the detail. Most of it was, the language was hortatory and recognition of public higher education. But there are about half the states have status for their state, state university in their constitutions, and some have assurance of autonomy in their state constitutions of a state university, it sometimes stands them in good steads when, when, po when political concerns about university uh, practices or performance come forward and, be, and, uh, and sometimes appropriately and sometimes not. So the list goes on and on. Assessment of real property for taxation. Anybody in the room who is in the, in, in the real estate business knows that our practices are problematic. We don't have systematic standards. We have some places in New York State that treat uh, commercial property differently than residential property. We have inequity in the distribution of the property tax burden. We don't have a single standard for assessment. We, don't, we have a standard for equity within jurisdictions, but not, and we have uh, great problems with, with equity across jurisdictions. You know, I, I, it's my view that we keep an entire state bureaucracy busy undoing what we do locally. Okay, so that's, a, that's an issue. So I made a list of 35, I, I ran out of energy. 67 is not a negative experience or negative reference. Now what would it cost? I calculated if you monetize the cost in 67, it would be $42 million. This is, a, this is for an organization in what, the 140 to $150 billion range. There's no consensus on an agenda, but think about election administration. Our election administration is scandalous. It's bipar this bipartisan election administration is actually excludes fundamental uh, great constituencies and uh, doubles the number of people we need to do the work and, is, uh, and is, is, a, is a biased process in its operation. We could do fair districting. We could do fair camp campaign finance. I know that's controversial with many people. We can get our separation of powers right. This may be attractive to the legislature, which has been subsumed in our system. We could do home rule properly. We could take dead letter law out of the Constitution. There's a lot of stuff in there. If you try to teach this to students when they read it, first of all, they can't manage the, the 51,500 words. And when they read it, they, you say, but wait a minute, that's no longer operative. That's no longer operative. One, one point. We have. What's dead letter law? Law that has no force or effect because it's unconstitutional under the national constitution or it's been subsumed by uh, one provision subsumed by another. Gotcha. So, so we have this three-day rule for, for, for matters sitting on, this, on, the, <coughs> on, this, on the benches of the, on the desks of the legislature before they can act. We have, a, we have a, the governor able to suspend that three-day rule um, for, under special necessity. This becomes a bargaining point so the governor can set the agenda of the legislature. So it has an unintended consequence. Then we bring the matter to the court, and one of our most distinguished judges says, you're right, this is not the way it should be, but I can't do anything about it because it would be too disruptive of the way things work. Now, I'm paraphrasing, and I don't want to be unkind to the judge. She's, there's a practical dimension to, to, to judging in the Court of Appeals. But it's shocking that we have, a, we have rules systematically in our Constitution. We have a limitation on borrowing. Everybody knows that, that the borrowing is not limited. We've got 67 ways around the limitation. 6% of our borrowing is done under the Constitution, 94% around the Constitution. So there's, th there's an agenda. Then, then we have the six-week rule. We have uh, discretion in offering the question. and. Uh, uh, we have what I call a belt and suspender situation. Three votes to call the convention to elect the delegates and to uh, look at the results. Proce process reform as a condition of, of a convention turns over control to the legislature and a convention will not happen. 
Now, my view is if we call a convention, now it's a risk-benefit calculation, and I care about all the things that wonks care about. I care about legislative power, separation of powers, sharing powers, all these weird things. I care less about the substantive stuff and much more about the process stuff. And I know that I'm unusual and kind of problematic. <laughs> but there's no other way to get at it. There's no other way to get at it. That's, what I, that's what I, the conclusion I come to. And are the risks real? Is anybody in New York who wants his or her work to be taken seriously going to challenge forever wild in the Constitution? That would be a suicide pact. So when you think about the risks that are real as opposed to the risks that are not real, you come to a different set of conclusions. Now, uh, my, one of my friends and colleagues here talked to me about the pension issue. That will be a real fight. But you know, at the end of the day, I don't think that would be changed substantially either in a constitutional convention with elected delegates in New York and essentially a Democrat uh, state. The legislature can block reform. It has a passive aggressive uh, posture. We're not, we're blocking reform. You said you needed reform, therefore we shouldn't do it. We're not prepared, therefore we shouldn't do it because we didn't prepare. If this sounds anti-legislative, I was a legislative leader for, for 12 years in a, in a, in a local government. Now, I'm not presumptively anti-legislative. I'm empirically informed by the behavior of this legislature. <laughs> now, what's going to happen if a convention is called on? Bob is getting a little desperate because he knows professors speak for 50 minutes. <laughs> What's going to happen? <laughs> the first thing that's going to happen is somebody's going to sue. Minority group advocates are going to sue and they're going to say your voting process is not in accord with federal requirements. It's the first thing that's going to happen. That's perfect. That's not bad, that's good. Because what happens when the lawsuit occurs is that a federal judge will get to say what the voting processes should be. And I've got ideas about what they should be. <laughs> and then the legislature will say, wait a minute. Not only are we, have, are we going to have a convention, but we're going to have a federal judge make the rules. This is the legislature talking to itself. We don't want that. We want to make the rules. We better adopt reforms that we prefer rather than have some federal judge make reforms that they prefer. Now, is this realistic scenario that Jerry Benjamin invented, or is this just uh, a way he amuses himself with the hours in the morning? <laughs> well, we, we, know that, uh, we know that when redistricting occurs and the two parties can't agree, the matter gets before a federal court. And we know that judges uh, appoint special monitors to create districts. And we know that the legislature chooses to act preemptively, almost always, didn't last time fully act preemptively, out of fear that some federal monitor will create fair districts. <laughs> and I'm not. <laughs> so the bottom line is we have to take the first risk in order to reap the benefit. If we don't take the first risk, we kill the baby aborting, we don't have a chance to reform New York. And I will tell you that I've been doing this for 50 years and uh, going on 50 years, and uh, I've been paying pretty close attention, and I always believed in partisan politics. I believed in dignity, in the dignity of the political life. I believe that political skills are special skills, and that people who have political skills and can aggregate majorities and representative bodies are special people. But I also believe that we need to push the restart button for New York, because New Yorkers have taken a walk. They don't believe in this system. They don't think that politics has a noble dimension. They think all it has is a corrupt dimension. We have to have a restart moment. And that moment is valuable apart from the substance. It's valuable as fundamentally needed for New York to gain confidence and faith that it can govern itself effectively and well. Otherwise, I'm neutral on the matter. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. We have just a couple of moments for one or two questions, and I'll bring the microphone around so we can have it for the video. Hey, um, I'm dealing with more authorities every year. I'm in the water and sewer business, and where does the authorities fit in with the Constitution? The creation of public authorities is, 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 uh, is authorized under the Constitution, and there's a statutory 
provision for the creation of local authorities and additional statutory provision for the creation of, of uh, state authorities. There are also uh, agencies that are lately created. Richard Brodsky, our, one of our colleagues in this, was very active in that, to oversee the authorities and to contain their reach. But uh, I, I will say this, without, I hope, not being insufficiently attentive to the substance of the question. Complexity defeats democracy. Our arrangements are so complex that citizens don't understand them, can't begin to understand them. Now, I'm not saying that a complex society doesn't need to have serious laws, but we have a degree of complexity to bypass our Constitution, bypass our laws, bypass our limits, that essentially makes our government unknown and unaccountable. And that's at the local level and at the state level. And, and we need to give consideration to that. And your, your, your question raises an example of that. We have time for one final question. And then, of course, Jerry will be available during the course of dinner for those of you who want to ask subsequent questions. Is there a final question? Well. Folks, I think we have heard one of the best talks that I can recall. And that's good. <laughs> now, I believe in best practices. Is there any state where you think this principle of constitutional adjustment has worked? <laughs> well, the, the, the speaker's strategy with a question like that is to give the answer you came to give. Don't answer the question. <laughs> no, no, it's a debater's, it's a debater's tactic. Um, the answer is that there are the Pew, uh, found, uh, the Pew Charitable Trust uh, funds um, annual or semi-annual assessment of, of government quality in various categories. And New York scores, notwithstanding our claims, B minus to C, to C minus. So that's the performance of our government. Can structural reform help the performance of our government? Well, there are some, I think it can. Can it fix our government fully? No. You have to ultimately, we're talking about ethics here, and Bob's organizing an ethics program shortly and at the law school, and I think it's going to be a very important program. But ultimately, you have to recruit the people to the system who will make it run well and effectively. You have to have a system that's properly designed. And we can take examples from different states about the proper design of the system, the proper rules for debate in the legislature, uh, creating a, a, a certain uh, accountability moving legislation more, more efficiently through the system, getting debate that's substantial and real on the floor of the body, where votes might actually change rather than be fixed before they reach, before they, the body, the, the matter reaches the floor. So there are structural remedies. There's no one state that has one best system. There are states that have different elements of, of what I think are, in my judgment, good systems. But uh, the point of, of staffing, I was in the Army. And uh, I was in and out of trouble when I was an officer because I was impatient with the Army. And uh, this is a little story. Bob's a military officer, too. And my colonel called me in one day on a particularly egregious, uh, uh, not life-threatening, but thing I did that he didn't like. And he said, Benjamin, you're a very smart fellow. And I said, thank you, sir. He said, you know, the Army is designed by geniuses. And I said, yes. He said, to be run by ordinary people. That's why we have this set of books here is called the Army Regulations. And your job is to follow them, not invent your own way of doing things. So we have to have systems that work, that are designed, but we also have to have people that run those systems well. And those are two challenges we face. That's the best I can do. Ladies and gentlemen, Jerry Benjamin. to you is that um, there's a, there was a very specific reason for wanting to bring you here today. 
When uh, Gary Smith had indicated last year that we should do a program at the Rockefeller Institute, I really struggled to find or to think of a program that would be interesting enough to have you and to engage your attention. One that was going to have import for you. Every single person in this room responsible for employees. If you go back to the 1997 vote, the largest percentage of people who went into the, into the voting booth did not vote yes or no on the proposition, they just didn't vote on it at all. And the reason that they probably didn't vote for it was because they didn't understand it and they had never heard of it. The reason that we brought you here today is to give you an opportunity to go back to your employees and to say simply, that there's a vote coming up and you should be aware of it. And we can provide you with the materials that you can put in your employee newsletters on your websites, that type of thing, in your mailers, if you send mail out to your customers. If we leverage ourselves this way, just the people in this room could probably touch tens of thousands, if not hundreds of, of thousands of people, and we can make an informed decision on November 7th, 2017. So we thank you for your attention to this matter, and it will not be the last time you hear of it, maybe the last time in the 50 group, but uh, as I had indicated earlier, this group of organizations is putting on more and more programming that you, you will be hearing increasingly about, and we ask that you be aware of it and un be aware of the stakes because they are significant and the opportunity is extraordinary. Um, we're going to go ahead. Uh, we have a buffet set up in the music room, which is just around the corner. And so if you folks can go ahead and queue up. Our next program is going to be at the Center for Internet Security across the river. It's a wonderful program. I had an opportunity to tour through there a couple of weeks ago, and I'd like to thank Spencer Jones for helping to organize that. We're going to be learning a little bit more about the Schenectady Casino, and we're going to be uh, doing that with a forum for executive women, as we had done last year when we put our program on about, uh, uh, about governance and uh, working with our employees and working with millennials, if I remember correctly. And our final program, our final official program is going to be about the new convention center. And then in June, we're going to give you an opportunity to tour the canal system on one of the canal tugs. And I hope that you can make time. And we're trying to see if we can make that happen both for you and your spouses or significant others. And so with that, I thank you again for your attention and I encourage you to enjoy dinner. Thank you. Thank you.